This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Today, I have the good professor on, a professor of organizational behavior at the Yale School of Management. That professor, Marissa King, teaches a popular course entitled Managing Strategic Networks. She studies how people's social networks evolve, what they look like, and why that's significant. And you already know with that brief intro why it's significant to you. Because everything today is about our social networks. It used to be only offline. We know how that's changed. It's basically all online now. And if you add in COVID, it's even more online now. Today we dive into Marissa's new book, Social Chemistry. And it is all about, as you have already guessed, networking. Understanding how this all connects our personal relationships, our work life, potentially our global impact. And how you do this, how you manage this, your network, there is a better way to think about this. There are tools and techniques, and the good professor donates a good portion of her life to figuring this all out for us. What do they say? You know, you can go learn about all this with personal experience, or you can go find a really smart person who's dedicated their life to getting to the answers. That is always the essence of this podcast. Without any further delay, let's jump right in and talk a little bit about networks with Marissa King. So let me keep you at what you just said a second ago. You were feeling a little bit down, a little bit uh, about uncertainty. I assume you're speaking to the American election. Both the American election and COVID, I think just the two of those, if we think about our social relationships and where we are in terms of social cohesion, it's a double hit in many ways. Yeah, I'm I'm not in the country at this moment. I'm in Vietnam and we have had no COVID here essentially. So it's been as an American to be in Vietnam and ha- not have COVID, you know, obviously all my friends and family are having to deal with everything that you're dealing with. It's been an interesting observation to be at a distance to watch what's going on. Being able to have that distance and some perspective on our social relationships is one of the advantages. When you can take a step back, you can also start to see just how profoundly important our relationships are. And I think that that, for many of us, has been an opportunity. If you want to try to find some opportunity or a silver lining in what's been unfolding over the past few months, that opportunity to step back and see just how important our social relationships are, are one of those few silver linings, I would say. I'll share something with you interesting, or hopefully it's going to be interesting for you. You might have already thought about this. I know you probably have done a mountains of research that I can't even imagine. But being in Asia for this has been quite interesting because, look, everyone's going to have their opinions and their political beliefs in Asia, just like they do in America. But universally in Asia, everyone masked up. They kind of just said, okay, let's do it. And look, I get both sides of the argument in the States as an outside observer. I say, okay, well, you know, some folks are worried about their liberty and other folks are worried about health. And then other people are worried about, is the government going too far? And are the rules arbitrary? Are they arbitrarily enforced? I get it all from the American perspective. But what's been really interesting to watch in Asia was almost like a sixth sense where everyone without big government mandates just kind of masked up. And there wasn't a debate about it. And people just kind of did it. And it's been really interesting to watch that social connection where everyone just kind of grouped together for the greater whole. Yeah. And what you're intuitively understanding, Michael, are some of the differences in social structure that exists between what networks look like in Asia and what they look like in the United States. If you just step back for a minute and think about all of our relationships on a day-to-day basis, whether it's bumping into someone at a coffee shop or a more enduring relationship with an old college friend, every type of interaction that we have really leaves this trace. And these traces 
you can create maps from. And these maps tell us a lot about our own individual lives, but they also can tell us about broader societal structure. And one of the core differences, if you look at networks and the relationships that exist in the United States versus those in Asia, in Asia, networks tend to be much more cohesive. They're much more integrated. There's a real strong value placed on deep, deep relationships. That's not as true in the United States. Some of those differences in the way that our networks are created just from these momentary interactions impact a huge outcome as simple as how likely is someone's going to respond and comply to social norms, such as mask wearing, but also how much social support are people feeling during this moment of social instability. To be at the intersection, to study this, to see all this social connection and the breakdown for you has got to be just fascinating. It's fascinating. It gives me hope. It makes me anxious. It's all of those. Even before all of this started, if you looked at the trends that were happening in the United States, rates of prescription drug abuse are up. Overdoses are up. Rates of loneliness are up. Suicide rates had been increasing. Anxiety was increasing. And those are really just all markers, really, of how socially connected are we with one another and how well are our social systems functioning? And that was prior to COVID. And if you think about what we're enduring now is it's this moment where we've, all of those are also up post COVID, but it's been this moment where the people have had an opportunity to really reflect on how relationships are important, what types of relationships do they have and really having to devote effort into thinking about how can we maintain these and what do we want our relationships to look like? If we want to succeed either personally in terms of well-being and emotional support, or if we want society to function better, what adjustments can we make? And so I think there's a profound opportunity that we're sitting on right now. And it depends on the day if I'm hopeful or not, I think. America has the great fortune and misfortune to be this great melting pot. So most of my life, I've heard the mantra and I've observed the mantra of, okay, this diversity makes us stronger. But when you spend eight years in Asia and you see the homogeneity and you see the sixth sense, for example, watching motorbikes in a place like Saigon, it's almost a hive brain. Everyone is working together. It looks like it's not connected, but it's clearly connected. And to see all that and to observe America it starts to make me thinking about tribes. Then it makes me look back to Europe. I mean, Europe is still a bundle of small nations, all nation tribes. How does that play in terms of your analysis when you start to look at the demographic makeups? I mean, is something like America, the great experiment, destined for success or destined for the trash heap if we start to compare to the rest of the world? Yeah, and thinking about that comparison of what does our diversity do for America, one of the key things to realize is there's immense possibility, as you said, in diversity, that we know that that's where innovation, creativity, there's so many benefits that come with diversity. But when you start to look at how we actually interact with one another on a day-to-day -day basis and delve into what people's networks look like, there's a ton of demographic diversity, but in every single interaction you look at, whether that's it the churches we go to, the organizations we affiliate with, our home, our neighborhoods, all of those tend to actually be composed of people who look and think like us. And this is an idea that has been really fundamental to understanding social science for decades is that there's this fundamental tendency for like to affiliate with like. We call it homophily, right? But you can think of it as birds of a feather. And because of that tendency, we tend to form groups that are basically talking to one another. And thus, even though there's this potential for diversity, they were actually just creating polarization because those groups aren't talking to each other. And where I think there's enormous possibility is if you think about where that's not true. If we want to harness this diversity, we have to think about how can we actually engineer these social interactions so these groups that often don't talk to each other start talking to one another. And there are some institutions that are really good at being able to do this. We know that certain types of ways of structuring schools make it more possible that you're going to be able to harness that diversity effectively. The same is true at the workplace. And that's why there's such possibility in the workplace. It's where our most diverse interactions happen. And it's also the place where we can think about how can we design interactions in a way that we have harness this diversity, but also have this cohesion that allows people to move forward effectively, like you were describing, is so characteristic of Asia. 
So let me get really macro for a moment. Everyone is connected. And I was trying to think before our call, when did it really happen? And I'm guessing maybe during the McCain-Obama campaign or early in Obama's presidency, I can recall where social media, which for me, I guess would be Twitter and Facebook, really just expanded to where like this, okay, I'm there every day. I'm checking something every day. When do you, in your mind, because look, networks have been around for a long time. Networking's been around for a long time. But in terms of the social network, when did this, in your mind, officially start? Is there a starting point in your mind? I think it's partially just human tendency. We've always had this, but I think your instinct about social media is important in the sense that what social media really is doing is it's amplifying your echo chamber. We tend to normally affiliate with people like us, but when we select into social media, social media is great for reinforcing community, but it doesn't allow us to get outside and talk to other groups. And I think that amplification really has happened over probably the past 15 years or so. What's been interesting and does give me hope is if we think about what's happened during COVID, everybody has gone online. If you look at some of the interactions that are happening now on some platforms, we're starting to see people who normally wouldn't talk to each other interacting more on social media. For instance, if you look at studies of LinkedIn and you look at how often women are talking to men in the workplace, it's much more likely actually to happen on social media than it is in other forms. If everybody is forced into this for some sort of reason, like work, I think that there's a possibility of overcoming this echo chamber effect, but typically it just serves to amplify existing positions and really heighten this polarization. See if you can help me with this question. I'm thinking about you. You have tremendous expertise, research time, lifetime spent at digging into these subjects, more than we will be able to cover in one hour. I mean, a tremendous amount of research. What I see and what concerns me about social media is that if you come onto social media and I can see your CV, I can go, okay, she has really put in some time. If I hear her, if I see her tweet or I see some comments on Facebook, the value that I'm going to place on those comments are higher. At least that's going to be my process. Now, I still might need to investigate more and to find out about, okay, where does her CV go? What's all of her background, et cetera? But I already know from the headline that your CV is higher on some subjects, like the things we're talking about today. What concerns me about social media, and I'm curious your perspective, is that social media seems to have flattened everything to where, to use an old American expression, every Tom, Dick, and Harry now has got an opinion. So if you walk into the courtyard and you have an opinion, It used to be that there was more respect afforded because of the time put into gaining the expertise that you have. Today, it seems like on social media, people don't care about that anymore. It's kind of like there could be just a bunch of lunatics that have no expertise and they could generate a huge following that even surpasses yours. It's like this most upside down thing. And I'm not trying to get you just to toot your own horn because we could apply this to many people, but I'm talking to you. So I'm using you as an example. Do you know what I mean? It drives me crazy. When you were talking about this, I think we've come to a point where there's this dynamic or challenge between actually expertise and emotion. And what you are describing in the way that I think about it is that oftentimes it's emotion creates engagement. If you're expressing really outrageous opinions, right, or anything or fear or anxiety, people tend to engage with that more, particularly on social media. The other piece of this is also the way in which those interactions happen. We know that text and just written communication in particular is actually not good at diffusing. And there's excellent research that's come out of Berkeley and other places that shows actually if you put people in a room and ask them to have a discussion just with voice, that the chances that they're going to agree and find some common ground is much better than if you're trying to have people just arguing on text. And because of the way that these interactions happen, both in terms of the more extreme views generate more engagement, but there's also not this voice and humanization to pull us together really makes the medium really, really difficult to shift into analytical thinking or expertise. And instead, we're just in this emotional turmoil. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. I've written a bunch of books about investments and stuff, but I can think about giving live presentations. And if I go give a live presentation, I've got a smile on my face. I mean, nobody ever trolls me from the audience. They don't say mean things to me. 
But if they want to engage with me in some kind of social media or they want to write a book review, I mean, it goes from being like pleasant to like, okay, you're the devil. It's, it's, this is where we've drifted to. It's amazing how people change when you don't have these really humanizing forms of connection, whether that's eye contact, a simple touch, voice. People put on an entirely different presentation of self. And it's also why it's so difficult not to have these one-on-one casual interactions. One of my favorite studies actually looked at what effect does it have to us to be interacting with a stranger, whether that's someone giving a talk or bumping into someone in the street. And one of the things they found is consistently that we are much happier just having simple human interaction. And what is at the core of that speaks to what you're saying, Michael, is what's driving that is in face-to-face human interactions, we're putting on a version of our best selves. And that allows us both to feel better about ourselves, but it allows human society function in a way that is much more pleasant for everyone. The problem is that when we don't have those human elements of engagement, we default to some a lot of competition, a lot of anger, and a lot of fear. Let's keep it at human interaction for a moment, specifically the lack of human interaction, which I think is at an epidemic level. You can probably tell me the numbers. You're going to know them a lot more than myself. And I'm driving at loneliness. And I can think of family members. I can think of friends. I can think of perhaps even strangers. I can read it on their face. And I'm sure myself at various points in time. I mean, come on, what's the old adage? We're born alone and we die alone. But you would think with all this technology connecting us all that loneliness would be dropping. But it's not really the case, is it? Not at all. This is one of the biggest myths I think that we face as a society, that this notion that it's the size of our network or how many people that we can connect with that's really critical. And we're at a moment, arguably, when we're in many ways more connected and more socially distant than ever. And if you look at the research, we're also more lonely than ever. My colleagues and I have recently done a study looking at rates of loneliness, which unsurprisingly have gone up. But what we were interested in is what helps guard against loneliness. To do that, we measured people's social networks pre-COVID, hundreds of people, and then we also looked at them really in the height of social lockdown. And what we found is that our networks have shrunk tremendously during COVID by more than 20%. But that network shrinkage really is at the outer layer, the people you connect with on social media, your acquaintances. And that shrinkage doesn't really matter for protecting against loneliness or increasing loneliness. What's been protecting people that have done well during this time is really the inner core of their network, their closest relationships. People who have five close friends have done much, much better over the past couple of months than people who have extraordinarily large networks. And that requires a fundamental shift in how we think about our social relationships. And it really highlights that there are some benefits to just focusing on the core, the people that are closest to us, our family. The problem is over the long term that that also leads to other social problems. But for right now, that's what seems to be saving people. When I think of COVID, we had a brief lockdown of 30, 60 days or so in the spring. And it was not fun. But when I think of COVID and we've got this situation where there is a lot of uncertainty, people don't know exactly still at this time the transmission. I think we all know by now that carrying too much weight is an issue. What is happening on the ground, though? What are the side effects, the add-on effects that are happening from the lockdowns? I mean, what is specifically happening to certain groups? Obviously, you mentioned, okay, people with the five friends, they're weathering it. But I mean, beyond catching COVID, beyond people dying of COVID, it sure seems like that when this is all said and done and we start adding up various statistics, there's going to be a lot more damage than just the death and sickness from COVID alone. Yeah, and I think those spillover effects arguably are going to have a much more detrimental long-term impact unless we can start to address them. And they're across the board. It's everything, as you started out with, Michael, thinking about physical health. We know that increased sense of loneliness or a lack of social connection has an effect on our health, long-term health and likelihood of premature mortality that's equal to obesity or smoking cigarettes. So there's a health complications that are going to be secondary effects of covid If we think about the labor market implications, McKenzie recently came out with a study that one in four women are considering leaving the workforce or scaling down. So it's very likely in a lot of different sectors and for a lot of different demographics that we're going to have a long-term exodus from the workplace that's going to be hard to recover from. 
I think our families are also going to be impaired in the sense that while we've been together in this, that you're seeing rates of divorce increasing, there's a lot of conflict. So across the board, whether you're thinking about physical health and well-being, well-being in the workplace, how likely business is going to do well moving forward, or even just whether or not our family systems are going to stay intact across the board that we're seeing hits for all of those. I was thinking about hacks and I was thinking about something that's happened to me in the last few months. I do yoga and I've talked about yoga on this podcast a lot. I'm pretty good at it, actually, really good at it. And I've got a teacher recently who at the end of class in Shavasana sings. She's got a beautiful voice. She just starts singing. When you think about all this social connection and stuff, people are looking for this and they're looking for that. And sometimes for me, and I want you can share back with me, but sometimes it's the small thing the small piece of connection that's not planned or not expected and that happens and then it hits you and and something happens inside and for me it's like if I could just find those moments and I think sometimes we don't have enough larger conversations about just finding the simple things in life to get a moment of happiness here a moment of happiness there and we all get fixated on some of this technology and this and that and all these other things And sometimes it's kind of like old grandpa stuff. It's like the little things are the things that we just sometimes need to think about and focus on. Yeah, you're exactly right. And the stories you were describing, your yoga teacher singing, it really hit me in a place that I really, where I think that our relationships come from. Our relationships, really the quality of our relationships are defined in the moment. And when we can figure out ways to bring each other together in the very moment, that's where our sense of well-being and connection really arise from. And there's beautiful research that speaks to exactly what you were talking to, Michael, about the power of these moments that truly do bring us together. Singing is a great example of this. There have been studies that have shown that when people are singing together, that their nervous systems are connected in the sense of truly getting under the skin with respect to our social connection. And we all start to synchronize. And you can think of other moments where this is true, whether it's a group singing together in a choir or cheering at a baseball game when everyone stands together and is collectively in the moment that there's actually a profound sense of connection that impacts our nervous system and as a result, our psychological well-being. And it's all of these decisions about how can we be truly connected and how can we come to that moment? In your description, you also talked about one of the hacks or downsides to this, and one of the biggest obstacles to that sense of connection really is often just simply distraction. There's great work that's shown that simply even having a phone on a table when you're having a meal decreases the perception of the overall quality of that meal. And it all boils down to distraction. And if we can get to that moment, whether that's all singing together, laughing together, simply giving a hug or really connected in a way that has a lot of power and takes us out of ourselves and brings us back to exactly where we need to be. I have to admit that if I hear a female voice singing and it's unexpected and it's passionate and you can tell that person loves what they're doing, they're not doing it for me. They're just doing it for themselves. The problem for me is I just fall in love immediately. It's that wild how we can truly fall in love with people that we've never met. And there's so many examples of this. What you're responding to is that sense of just voice and presence. There's also research that shows that you can actually make people fall in love or report a sensation of love by staring in the eyes of strangers. Just a deep need for this social connection and a deep need for love. And sometimes we project that right onto the other person. But I think it's just because a fundamental need that we all have is getting met. Yeah, it's crazy. Let me shift you from something nice sounding like that to something a little more daunting and a little more sad. I mean, I guess all these topics where we're trying to get people to connect better, I guess there's, it's often sad to think about it that so many people are not connected. Tell me about your work with your thinking, your research into connecting the social networks with the prescription drug abuse. One of the reasons I bring that up too, I've got a only had a handful of first cousins, but one of them 10 years ago after surgery got hooked to OxyContin, I think. And eventually the military never really defined exactly how he passed as a young guy in his early 30s, but it was from oxy abuse. Speak to me about what you're seeing and the connections you're making. I'm sorry for your loss. And it's a challenge that so many families are facing is just impact and loss arising from whether it's prescription drug abuse or other types of substance use disorders. And 
What we can see time and time again, if you look at various demarcators of just general well-being, what, how does it seem like people are doing, that you see things that look like epidemics. And that's fundamentally what I'm interested in as a researcher or understanding what leads to these epidemics. But if you look across time, what you'll see is that we see them in lots of different manifestations, whether that's opioid addiction, whether that is suicide, across the board, you're seeing rates increase in a way that just can't be explained by individual predisposition alone. And if you talk to people who are struggling with addiction, what you'll hear again and again is that the opposite of addiction is really connection. Across the board, what it seems to be happening is we're seeing all of these diseases of despair really increasing, arguably because fundamentally that there's a lack of social connection. It's the driver in the sense that that lack of social connection exists, but then they use the social networks to find out a way to get past the pain. Is that a good way to phrase it? I mean, because what's the way that everyone is finding out I should be taking pharmaceutical heroin? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, and this is a hard piece for someone as a networks researcher, that networks are part of the problem, but they also can be part of the solution. If you look at that sense of loneliness and despair, that social isolation or feeling of loneliness just creates, truly creates physical pain. And people are going to medicate that in all sorts of different ways. But the solution oftentimes to that sense of isolation is social connection. That's one way of treating this. But you can also think about different modalities that people are getting access to treatment, whether or not that's social support or actually access to medication-assisted treatment. All of that relies on getting outside of that box of isolation and starting to get help outside. I'm taking you around the maypole of all these different issues. You've got so many cool topics in your world. Let me get to one that's even bigger and maybe even gets at some of the angst that you were describing in the very beginning about the current election cycle in America. So in a past life, I ran for political office, past life, political science major, I grew up in the Washington, D.C. area. I have a very good feeling for how the sausage is made there. I think if people understood how the sausage was made in Washington, D.C., they'd have far less angst. They'd probably just be mad that (laughs) that what goes on there, you know? But I tell you the thing that I'm seeing, I'm not seeing this stated openly. I think the data supports it. I think the voting data supports it. But if I put aside the partisan labels, the liberal conservative, the red, the blue, To me, it sure looks like, and the voting data supports this, that we're moving towards the men party and the women party. It depends on how you draw the divisions. I thought you were going to take this to geography. We've been used to, I think, seeing these geographic dividing lines, but we are also starting to see these rifts, not just by geographic lines, but also starting to see them across gender lines, which is particularly disconcerting to me is that means that division has infiltrated within our households. And once that happens, the level at which we're impacted by it on a day-to-day basis is so much greater. I have family I love and I adore in the South, and we have very different opinions, but I don't live with it on a daily basis as I would if that division were within my house. I bring it up because I wonder if the network effects are compounding both sides, so to speak, men and women, getting more kind of entrenched in their either learned or natural perspectives on life. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, and this is a little bit general, but as an outside observer, and I try to outside observe myself too, I'm always talking with my sister and hearing about her friends. And it, it often looks like that, and again, being very bell curve general here, that men will often come at things from a more logical perspective, and women will come at things from a more feeling perspective, a more kind of like, how does it affect the group perspective? Whereas men are kind of saying, let's be objectively true regardless of how it affects the group. And women are more looking at and saying, hold on, there's a group here we have to worry about. I just wonder if we are seeing a situation where something like social media is reinforcing that to the extent that in a place like America, In not a good way. Are we getting to a place? I mean, can you feel any of this that I'm describing? I mean, again, the voting data kind of says that men are going to the right and women are going to the left. The data definitely supports that. There are a lot of 
social factors that are feeding into this. If you look across the board, whether that's interactions at work or our friendship groups, that men and women tend to affiliate with like women at work are talking to women, men are talking to men. There's was recently data, the New York Times were asking people how appropriate is it, for instance, for women and men to have a work lunch together? How appropriate is it for them to have a meeting together? And there's a really strong prohibition to women and men interacting. So that's a first order problem in the sense that if we want to have some common ground or be able to engage in this in perspective taking, and it's really perspective taking that's going to get us out of this ideological opposition, then we need to be interacting. That polarization of simply just not talking to one another also becomes really heightened during times of tension. What we tend to do when we're in a moment of tension or disagreement is actually focus even more inward in our group. We're just looking more and more to ourselves. And as you said, Michael, the values that women and men hold oftentimes are quite different. The inability to engage with one another and engage in perspective taking is going to make those differences just greater and greater unless we can figure out how to talk to one another. I'm in a relationship with a lady, but I have to tell you, it's very difficult for me. I don't know how to handle it sometimes. I don't know the best way to handle it. I don't know the appropriate norm. Things are a little bit different in Asia than the States. I know we've had the Me Too movement in the States, but you know, as a male interacting with, in this day and age, a female that I'm not in a relationship with, who may or may not be attractive, but attractive makes it even more difficult. It's a real conundrum. It's not the average conversation. It's not something that a conversation that I've had on this podcast before, how do we bridge this? How do we get to this point in time? Or is it always going to be, you know, going back to like, I don't know, like a 1970s term, the battle of the sexes or something. I mean, is it always going to be this men and women tension? Will we ever be able to get to the point where we can feel comfortable having opposite sex friends and not having concerns? I mean, it's very difficult. Yeah, it's really difficult. The issue is if we don't get past that, then we're never going to see equality in the workplace. Our ability to just function well as a society is going to be really hampered. There's tons of evidence about this, in particular, the ways in which that sense of prohibition or that it's not okay for women to interact with men really impedes women. For instance, we know that women who are sponsored or mentored by a man post-MBA have a salary increase of around $30,000 versus mentored by another women. That's a huge effect on just women's pay. It's the equivalent of whether or not actually you negotiated for your salary at all or not. But the problem is actually go into an organization and you ask who should be mentoring whom. Most of the time it's women mentoring women. It's just the way that we default. There's all sorts of social prohibitions and social tension around this. And in order to get past it, we need to actually start seeing each other, not as men and women, but as human and human. Part of doing that and one of the most effective ways for us to move forward in this, I think, is that from a first order perspective, is actually just engaging in perspective giving rather than me trying to ascertain what your perspective is, like creating a space in which people can feel honest about sharing that this is the way I see things and this is the way that you see them. Being able to begin just that conversation about allowing us to connect on a human level. This is one of the few places in where I think actually the move to virtual work has been helping. It's much easier for me to have a conversation or a coffee with guy at work than it would be under a normal circumstance because many of those tensions evaporate once you create this social distance through virtual interactions. I think there's some hope actually in the recent shift that we've had to more online work. As I take you around all these different topics, I must tell the audience, since I have your book, this is a deep read. This is not light reading. I mean, when you, the title of the book, Social Chemistry, Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection, this is a really kind of like get into the weeds, really look at so many factors. I mean, for example, I'd never heard of the Dunbar number. I'll let you explain it, but it was just fascinating to look at some of these things that you've brought together, ways that most of us don't ever look at relationships and connection. If you think about how we spend our days, we spend our days interacting with other people. And if you think about what those interactions produce, our networks, they're arguably the most valuable thing that we have, whether that's in our personal lives or our professional lives, but no one really understands 
how their network works. And by starting to provide some perspective or decoding how our networks actually work, it gives you much more stronger ability to start to work with your network to help get the things that you need out of it, but also to give back. Dunbar's number is profoundly important in that regard because it allows you to see what are some of the fundamental social truths that we all face. Robin Dunbar, who is a professor in the UK, has spent his life doing his understanding human social systems. And this number, his most famous number is 150. And 150 is the maximum number of people within your social world that you can maintain continuous interaction with. We all have limits on how much time we have and our cognitive ability. And because of that, there's only a certain number of relationships that we can maintain. And the 150 number is the number of people that you would feel comfortable if you bumped out into at a bar or sitting down and having a conversation with uninvited. But it's actually a profoundly important social number. It has an important historical relevance. So it's also been shown to be the largest size that you can have within an army company that was the average, the, one of the largest sizes of civilizations that we'd, you would see before we had the ability to technologically interact. It really is the number of people that you can actively monitor and know who has your back. If you're thinking about your own network, that's really where the core value comes from. And knowing who is in your 150 can make your ability to manage your existing social relationships much easier. One of the things I like about your work, there's many things I like, but one of the issues that you bring up, the notion of giving. So here we are trying to get connection. We're trying to find ways to improve connection. This podcast that you and I are on right now was started on a lark, and it was at first based on my trading people that I knew, trading authors and guests and investors, et cetera. But then one day I said, well, gosh, I'm kind of bored with this. And I shifted and I, in short order, got Dan Airely on and I got Daniel Kahneman on. And then once they came on, it was like, okay, I'm going to talk to everybody now. The reason I do this, I don't get paid or anything. It's just now I've been doing it for eight years. I just love doing it. I get to talk to you. How else would I get to talk to you, right? How else would we be able to share and kind of go back and forth? I think the reason it motivates me, okay, I guess... In some ways, it helps my business. It keeps my name out there and all that kind of fun stuff. But I find there's a kind of a karmic benefit to giving. So here you are right now. You want to let people know about your work. You have got a cool new book out. I feel like there's something beneficial to me to give someone like yourself and many other people a chance to share that. And then I get a chance to learn. And it's kind of like this back and forth, back and forth, like a tennis match. Not a competitive one, but more of a kind of give here, give here. I don't think enough people understand that because a lot of people would look at what I do and they would say, well, Mike, you don't get paid for that. Why are you doing that? That's so stupid. I'm true, really. What you just described, I think, is one of the fundamental problems with how most people approach their social relationships. What you were describing is oftentimes, if you think of the importance of giving, it's arguably the most important thing that you can do to build your relationships. There's something that's known as the norm of reciprocity, the sense of give and take that is at the fundamental core of how relationships operate. And Adam Grant has done beautiful work on this. The flip side of thinking about giving is that people oftentimes think about their networks or their relationships, and particularly networking is a very instrumental approach. When you say networking, what most people think about is this sense that I'm going to go out and meet someone who's going to help me either get a job, get things done, whatever they, they, they're looking for something out of relationships. But the vast majority of people actually feel a moral aversion to that sense of a relationships. And there's a whole reason, there are lots of reasons why that's true. But at the most fundamental level, our relationships are actually really, really sacred. So the idea for many people of profiting from them or commoditizing them just creates this moral aversion. There have been studies that were one of which was led by Tiziana Cacharo at Rotman, who found that if you even just tell people about this, you ask them to remember a situation where they went to a networking event and asked for something or were trying to get something that they feel like they need to go at, literally wash their hands. They value cleaning products more. And it's what that's revealing is that as humans, we have a really fundamental aversion to this notion of profiting from relationships. But if you can just flip that and think about in a relationship, what can I be giving? 
it really creates a radical reorientation to social connection that is beneficial, not just for you, but for everyone that you're interacting with and everyone in your network. And that's one of the things that I get most excited and find most beautiful about networks. It's just one of the few human social systems where the more you put into it and the more you give, the more that everyone benefits. And when I think about a situation like our conversation right now, and this happens with many other guests that I've had on this show, I've had some repeat guests for sure, but maybe, maybe you and I don't ever get a chance to have a coffee together. Maybe we don't ever talk again, but our conversation will live on forever. And at some point in time, it will be indexed just like blogs were indexed. For me, I look at it as like, well, gosh, it's like a, a near free opportunity to not only create a network of interesting people, but it's something that gets to live on forever. And that just is, that's cool to me. That's like a cool feeling. What are we supposed to do in this life? What are we supposed to do? Just go work for the man every day? I enjoy the process of creating this network. And I don't even know what the heck I'm going to do with it. I have no earthly idea. Maybe nothing happens. Maybe something happens. But it's that kind of childhood experimentation mindset. You're a stranger to me. I'm a stranger to you. Who cares? And too many people, as you say, the commoditization of it, the kind of making money off it. Well, hold on, Mike. How can you talk to a stranger? Maybe that stranger will never do anything for you again. No, no, no. That's not the way it works. You're a stranger that's coming on my show, so you've already done something for me. So the reciprocity is already there. It's embedded. And people just don't see this. Yeah, it's something that I try to remind myself every day. Not to bring us back to the darkness, but it's true. Like at the end of the day, I think about at your funeral, what actually matters. No one's going to look at your CV. No one's going to report what's in your bank account. What's going to matter at the end of the day are the relationships that you formed over the course of your life. What we know is that, yeah, it certainly matters, the connections to the people closest to you, but we derive as much joy and pleasure out of interacting with strangers as we do our closest family and friends. There's something about even whether it's in a momentary basis, the ability to just connect and have conversations and be human and focused on what actually matters versus at the end of our lives, what are we going to look back and say was actually the most important thing? And for me again and again, whether it's in the moment or at the very end of my life, if I can just have the orienting point be relationships, then I usually have a very, very good day. It's such a fun topic. I mean, we can just go on and on and on. I'm going to take you on a couple more things that I kind of jotted down before we talked. And I think one of the most interesting social networks to me, and I want your full perspective, is LinkedIn. I log into LinkedIn perhaps once a month. There's got to be 5,000 plus people connected to me. I log in. I don't know why I still log in. I don't do anything there. But I log in and there's often hundreds of requests to be my friend on LinkedIn. I wonder, some of these, it seems like Twitter is a much more open engagement type thing, often too much vitriol and whatnot, but what's your perspective on LinkedIn? I've not really figured out what to do with LinkedIn, even though I've got an account and thousands of people that want to be connected, but I don't have any earthly idea what to do with it. It's funny, if you think about LinkedIn and where it originally evolved from, LinkedIn really was initially designed as a platform that allowed people to look for jobs without looking like they were looking for jobs. But what's been interesting, particularly over the past year or two, is that it's become a way of socially engaging that isn't necessarily anymore so much about looking for a job. It's about putting forward our professional selves. And why I think that LinkedIn is starting to get more engagement and people are increasingly turning there is because the way that we are having conversations on other platforms and what we're putting forward isn't necessarily our best selves. So there's this bizarre movement towards actually being able to create a space in which we can put our best selves forward. We can have conversations that are a little bit more out of our echo chamber. So conversations on LinkedIn, who's interacting with whom is actually more diverse than you would see on other platforms. And I think that that's because we're getting a little bit more out of our echo chamber on that platform than we are in others, in part because of what we're putting forward and how we're presenting ourselves. Maybe this podcast has become my version of LinkedIn. That's interesting you said that because I, I will actually dip in again and see what's going on. But I think you're making the case, at least it's, I'm thinking of myself in the sense that my podcast has become my LinkedIn. Yeah, it makes it perfect sense. Your podcast is in many ways actually a much deeper form of LinkedIn in the sense that 
anytime you can move towards more depth and communication, so longer communications, more voice, you're creating both a sense of engagement for yourself, but everyone that you're talking to. I think that the more you can move towards that level of depth of engagement, the better, but there is certainly a benefit. Our professional selves actually has some benefit. Like you don't want to see me necessarily when I wake up with my three kids and like haven't had coffee yet. This is in many ways a much better version of myself. So I think there's something to be said for putting that out there. A couple more things I wanted to bring up. Authentic. That's one thing I try to do on this podcast. And I think maybe it's the only reason people listen. I try to be authentic. I try to, I don't know if I try to be authentic where I just, I don't want to say I am. That sounds kind of cocky, but I don't think about how it's going to affect me if I say this word or that word. I often tell people that my favorite guests on this show are generally older men, men over 70, because they just have no filter and they just start talking and whatever's happened in their life, they just tell you about. And I find that gets the most engagement, perhaps because there is no filter and people are, they're at that point in their life where perhaps they still care, but maybe they really don't care and they just talk. There's something about that that I just love when you can find that experience where people just, just like syrup just goes on and they just share their story. And it's like, and that's the whole point of the podcast stuff sharing stories. I could have taken you, I could have pulled your book out and I could have taken you down the data road and we could have done kind of a PowerPoint deck presentation. I could have gone this bullet, this bullet, this bullet, and you would have humored me and you would have done it. We could have gone down through everything. People are gonna have to go read the book for all that, but it's much more interesting to try and get some stories and to get some, again, social connection, some human connection in the conversation. And then people really enjoy that. There's something that's so profoundly compelling about that level of authenticity. As you were describing that, I was trying not to take offense. I'm like, oh, I'm not a man over 70, but I think we're okay. (laughs) But you know my point. It's like grandpa. You know, when you sit there and you listen to grandpa talking, it's kind of like that. Yeah, I do. And I think that there's something that we oftentimes don't talk about with respect to authenticity, which is that in many ways, when you have power and you have privilege, it's much easier to be authentic. If I think even back to my own professional life, when I was starting out as a a newly mentored professor, had never been in front of business school students, I would get so nervous that I honestly had to take beta blockers in order to be able to stand up in front of a class. And in part, that was because I had been given the advice, watch someone else and just try to do what they do. And I had no sense of confidence. I had no standing. I just tried to be someone else. It didn't work at all. As I've progressed in my career, it becomes much easier because you get that, like, I don't care. It doesn't matter. But for many people, whether that's you're a woman, you're a person of color, you're earlier in your career, you're trying to figure out like, how can I be myself in this environment, but not get penalized from it? I think it's tricky. When I was describing at work, I try to be my best self. I realized I cannot be anyone other than I am. It just doesn't work. I think that doesn't mean though, that you need to show everyone everything, particularly if you're not in power. It's also too that... I think we all have to be honest about the way human learning, building achievement, skills, et cetera, it takes time. None of us, unless we're some savant, are terribly interesting at 25. People can feel that. They know that you're you, I, et cetera, that we're not as comfortable. But I think maybe the only way, and you mentioned taking beta blockers, the very first time I gave a public presentation, I was 19 in front of a city council. I somehow or another found my way. It's like one of the only pharmaceuticals that I can think I've ever taken because I've never done any of these oxy things for any kind of injury or nothing like that. But I took half a Valium. And now I laugh about it 30 years later. I laugh about it 30 years later that I was so nervous where now you can wind me up like a toy and I can talk in front of a thousand people and I don't care. But at 19 in front of 20 people in a public forum, I was like, oh my God, I need to take half a Valium. We all laugh about it. The thing that you described, though, too, there's only one way around that. And we're just kind of on a side tangent for public speaking. Practice is the only way. It's true for public speaking, but it's also true for people with social anxiety. Like one of the best ways to get over it is actually just to be like, you have to do it. 
one of the hopes within my book is actually to provide a set of tools that make getting over that uncomfortability a little bit easier. Everything can be learned, whether that's public speaking, whether that's social interaction, but you have to have that learning mindset and be willing to do it. And have, really, it's honestly about also just letting that fear go and realizing like, oh, it's worth it. Connecting with other people is really, really worth it. At the beginning of that stage, like, is it really worth it? And how can I possibly do it? It's worth it. It is so much fun when you forget that you're standing on an island and you forget that you're really not any better than anyone else. And then you can just talk and you look at them and they look at you, they smile, you smile, et cetera. That feeling is so much fun to be able to impart to everybody else that might be in the audience something they don't know and you can give them an aha moment. And you know this as a professor, of course. That's a fun feeling. That's connection right there. It's amazing to be able to just see someone else's perspective and connect in that way. It brought me right back to when you were talking about this yoga teacher singing. I'm like, oh, I just wish I could sing. There's something just profoundly beautiful about hearing someone else's voice, whether that's their singing voice or being able to see their perspective. It's what makes the world interesting. I can tell you with this particular teacher, other students, I've watched this now. They've come to her class for the first time. And this class is super crazy hard. It's like this core fitness yoga. I can't even walk for a couple of days after. It's insanity. And then she sits down and she sings this kind of chanting stuff. Some of these students, you can see, they're coming back. Literally, they'll go through the, the very hard class. They just want to hear the voice. You know, when one of those moments happens, I wish I could, maybe I'll have to get her if she'll sing for me and I'll bring it on the podcast. I've told her too. I was like, listen, if you just keep doing that, I'm just going to like fall asleep and not wake up for a couple hours or something. But again, it's the whole thing. The whole point of your conversation, our conversation today, your book is all about where do we get this social chemistry from? Where is the human connection coming from? And it's, it's the little things often. It's almost always the little things, the beautiful, beautiful, beautiful little things. Hey, great stuff, Marissa. The book, Social Chemistry, Decoding the Patterns of Human Connection. People can go check that out. I want to restate that this is, even though I've taken you around in all kinds of subjects and all kinds of topics, the book is very granular. There's a lot of detail here. This is not light reading. This is one of those ones that sits on the shelf forever and you pick it up and you kind of go through it and you're like, okay, wow, okay, that's an aha moment. It's definitely one of those books. It's not... Sometimes I see business books and it's like, you know, okay, that business book was 250 pages and it revolved around one sentence. This is not one of those books. (laughs) Thank you so much, Michael. That's probably the kindest thing you could have said. (laughs) But you know what I'm talking about. You've seen these books too. Hey, Marissa, is there a website you want to send people to? They can check you out at Yale, but where else would you like to direct people to? Sure. You can learn more about your own network at assessyournetwork.com or you can learn more about me at marissaking.com. Cool. Marissa, thank you for coming on. Hey, please keep me posted when the next book comes. There's always going to be another book. Once you do one, two, I don't know how many you've done, but once you do at least one, there's always another one. I hope so. I'd love to connect again, Michael. Hey, thank you. Take care. Thanks so much. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right Trend Following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, Trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.